Okay, well, good morning, everybody. It's an early morning, um, but I'm excited to be here um, and to, I mean, the, the, the talks I've heard yesterday were amazing. This day looks like a great day as well. Um, so I'm excited to share with you some, some work that uh, is published, some work that is, as Leonard Murray would say, even unbiarchived. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very curious to see how, how uh, you guys uh, respond to some of the ideas we're developing on chromosome entanglement uh, and disentanglement, which is a, a topic that we don't hear a lot about, um, but uh, hopefully I will uh, explain to, to you how we are thinking about that and, and actually how chromosome topology, real topology, catenations, decatenations, these old textbook style phenomena are actually really important uh, phenomena to consider when you study chromosome folding. So my lab is interested in uh, how chromosomes fold. Um, because the human genome, uh, for instance, that we study mostly, um, uh, in order to understand how it works, we have to understand how it's folded. So, so we're understanding just what is the folding of chromosomes. We spent a lot of time uh, looking at that over the years. Uh, but, but more recently, we're starting to understand the molecular machines and mechanisms, and biophysical mechanisms in some cases, uh, through which chromosomes are folded. And of course, ultimately, we want to know how that folding relates to genome function. Um, Genome function includes things like gene expression. We hear a lot about that, uh, but my lab more focuses typically on chromosome inheritance, chrom genome stability, and uh, phenomena like that, which are also very important functions of the genome. So when you think about uh, chromosome folding, at least in, in vertebrates or, or uh, in, in eukaryotes, uh, we know of two phenomena, and we hear a lot about it at, at this meeting and, and others. Uh, the first is that if you just look at a cell nucleus, the genome is compartmentalized uh, into two, uh, at least two types of chromatin, heterochromatin and euchromatin. They're spatially segregated from each other uh, through a process that is probably related to phase separation of the block of polymer. Um, and we, there's probably this is a biophysical process by which uh, different types of chromatin segregate from each other. Uh, at a smaller scale, uh, chromatin loops form uh, and we hear a lot about the complexes that make these loops, like condensins and cohesins. And we know a lot about the molecular mechanisms now by which these loops form. Uh, and these two phenomena are really typically the most important uh, phenomena that people study or think about when they talk about chromosome folding. So in high C, these different features can be easily seen. So in a microscope, we can see this compartmentalized nucleus with heterochromatin in red and euchromatin in green spatially segregated. If you make a high C map, you can see such spatial compartmentalization. Here we have a contact map of one chromosome of this checkerboard pattern, which represents the spatial segregation of two types of chromatin. We now know there's probably more than two, uh, but globally there seems to be like two different types of uh, uh, compartments, uh, and they segregate in space, giving you this checkerboard pattern in long-range interactions. And the idea is basically that the chromosomes are segregated over these different uh, types of compartments. Um, if you look more closely, um, oops, there we go. If you zoom in more closely along these diagonals of these high-C contact maps, we start to see these very rich structures emerging. We can see dot-like uh, 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 loop-like structures, which are point-to-point -point interactions. We can see lines, we can see all kinds of boundaries and squares. This looks very complicated, and for a long time it was unclear how you make all these different features at this length scale of several hundred KB. Uh, we call these domains uh, topologically associated domains. Um, we can talk about the term topological in this context, maybe at the end. Um, but um, all these different structures we now know are formed by a single process, and that is loop uh, uh, extrusion uh, through uh, action of uh, cohesin, mostly in interface and condensins uh, in mitosis. So, so that is the one molecular process of chromosome folding that we now understand in, in great molecular detail. It can be done in vitro. We can measure. We, meaning others in the field, uh, can study uh, at, a single, at a single molecule level how these kinds of complexes work. Here is me doing a single molecule experiment, uh, and th this is basically the process of loop extrusion where a complex can land on DNA and extrude loops in an ATP-dependent manner, acting strictly in cis, uh, which I think is a key feature of this process. Um, and of course, as I said, others uh, like Case Decker uh, and, and, and Eric Green and several others are now able to reconstitute this uh, on an immobilized DNA molecule, and they can see 
loop formation by these complexes. I think this was really a revolutionary insight a few years ago based on theory from Leonid and others, an experiment from Case and others. Uh, really brought all these things together and explained, I think, a very significant part of the high C data that we observed. Okay, so here's just an example of, of uh, some work from Leonid's lab. If you have cohesins or any loop extruders landing on DNA and you have blocking sites that block extrusion like CTCF sites, you get a, an ensemble of structures that when you predict a high C contact map basically looks like what we see in experiment. This is intensely studied now because this is already a few years old, this slide. I mean, now there's many more features happening. You can have cohesin loaded at specific places, paused at specific places, blocked at specific places, unloaded at other places. So there's lots of cis elements along the genome that guide this process and probably contribute to gene regulation. And this is a topic of intense study by many in the field. Okay, so if you want to understand chromosome folding, what we realized a number of years ago is that looking at the cell cycle is a really great model system because during the cell cycle, chromosomes change. I'm always a little bit afraid of the cell cycle. There are too many kinases that I can't tell apart. Um, but actually, just from a chromosome point of view, it's a wonderful system because during the cell cycle, the chromosomes change their shape dramatically, and that gives you an experimental, we, my lab is mostly experimental, an experimental opportunity to disentangle the mechanisms by which chromosomes are folded. So here is some early work we did, again, with, with Leonid Murney, uh, uh, where in interface we have this beautiful checkerboard pattern which represents compartmentalization. Along the diagonal we have loops and cohesin-driven extrusion features. Uh, in metaphase, all these structures disappear, and you have this rather uh, dull-looking uh, high-C contact map. So this gives us an opportunity to, in real time, following how cells perform this act of converting this interface structure into a metaphase structure and back. So we did a lot of work on this. I will just summarize what we've learned. We learned in mitosis, the chromosomes forms a rod-like structure, highly packed array of loops. This is basically Uli Lemley's model that he proposed in the 70s and 80s of last century. Um, and we can confirm that the high c data is actually consistent with such a looped array structure, which is kind of amazing if you look at the high c map, which is quite uh, boring. Uh, we think the loops are about 80 kb in size, which is uh, consistent with what had been seen in the electron microscope. These loops, and this is a key point, are not positioned at any specific sequences, like in interface when you have loops between specific sequences. That's not happening in mitosis. These loops can be anywhere, and that's why the population average high c maps don't give you any features. These loops are made not by cohesin, but by these other two loop extruders. Okay, so now just very diagrammatically, what we were about a number of years ago, we, we had this insight in the interface conversation, uh, com, conformation with a number of compartmental domains, uh, uh, cohesin-driven loops, and then in metaphase you have condensin-driven loops and the shape of the chromosome is totally different. Now, I will just summarize in one slide what we learned is actually covered in a number of publications from us and several other uh, major contributors in the field, uh, how cells can take this interface structure and convert it into the metaphase structure and back. So we've delineated what we refer to as folding pathways by which cells convert one step, one, one conformation of the genome into another. Okay, so actually this is uh, <coughs> what we came up with. Um, so just to, whoops. Orient you, here we are in G2, these replicated chromosomes. Basically, G2 looks just like what I showed you before for interface. We have compartments and loops and, and all these things. When cells enter prophase, within a few minutes, this structure can be taken apart. And now condensing two makes an array of loops, which is already in the microscope a long rod-shaped structure. Then by prometaphase, which is later in mitosis, uh, condensin one joins condensin two, and now we have two extruders acting on the chromosome simultaneously, forming an, a series of nested loops within loops, basically. Uh, and what we found was really uh, the most striking thing is that this loop array acquires some kind of a helical arrangement, at least on average, in the cell population, as if these loops start rotating around the central axis of this chromosome. And of course, coiling has been seen in the microscope for many years uh, and sometimes been dismissed as a fixation artifact. Uh, but at least in high C, we can see uh, some features of helicity. Then in metaphase, we have this very compacted array of loops. 
Then cells divide, chromosomes segregate, and now we have this very strange phase that we discovered, a telophase. This is a very naive state of the genome. All the loop extruders have let go of the chromosome, and you have this free-floating, naive chromosome. There are no compartments, no loops. Uh, and that's the beginning of the rebuilding of the interface conformation. And that actually takes several hours. Uh, first, cohesin comes back, starts making loops, tads and loops reemerge, and then compartmentalization, which is a large scale, megabase scale by a physical process, what we believe is phase separation, actually takes four to eight hours to complete, in, at least in these cells that we looked at. Okay, so what we, we were initially had just these two states, and now we have all these intermediate states. So this whole process, the dynamic is driven, at least in part, by alternating the machines that fold chromosomes. So in interphase, we have cohesin. It's being replaced by condensin, although both cohesin and condensin are working on prophase chromosomes. Then by telophase, there's no, none of these machines on the chromosomes. And then cohesin comes back. So this kind of alternation of these loop extruders kind of determines to a large extent what the chromosomes will look like. In addition, we have also alternating compartmentalization. So compartmentalization is detectable in interface, but not detectable in mitosis. Don't quite know why. Why would those domains not attract each other if they have some intrinsic affinity for each other? So the we don't know anything, actually. There's very little known about the machineries or the biophysical properties of chromatin that drive this compartmentalization and how it changes during the cell cycle. But again, this is an example of studying chromosome folding during the cell cycle, giving you an opportunity to study it because it's dynamically changing. So that gives you, as an experimentalist, an opportunity to study what is happening. Okay. So these two processes of loop extrusion, compartmentalization, again, as I said, are the main focus of a lot of labs in this field. And I said this before, we have these two different phenomena. And the question I'm asking today is, are there other phenomena that we need to look at? Are these the only two things we should be looking at? And of course, I'm going to ask you this question because I think the answer is yes, there are other things to look at. They're difficult things to look at from an experimental point of view. And that is topology. So I haven't talked about topology, although the term Topology is often used in this field, including in the, the title of this morning's session. Um, I have used the term topology for topology associated domains. I've gotten a lot of flack for it over the years, because what do you mean topology? So classically, topology is often discussed in the context of circular DNA molecules. And circular DNA molecules can be supercoiled, they can be knotted, they can be catenated. Um, and this is a, a thing that happens in plasmids, in yeast mini chromosomes. This happens in bacteria. How much of it does happen in eukaryotes that have linear chromosomes? So often people think a linear molecule can actually not be knotted. No, you can just always, from a true, pure topological point of view, you can unknot it. However, if you have loops along a linear molecule, like made by cohesin or condensin, these loops could become catenated. So locally, this could be a topological phenomenon that these two structures are distinct if these loops are closed. Or if you think about two chromosomes that are really, really long, and they interact with each other locally, they actually don't know that, these, that they're on a linear chromosome or on a circular chromosome. The ends are too far away to ever no, be noticed. So locally, you could get a catenation or an entanglement uh, that, that actually needs to be resolved by topo 2 at a time scale that we're looking at here, for instance, a few hours or even less time than that. So linear chromosomes could locally think they're catenated, and their resolution would probably require strand passage by topo some rays too. Now, does any of this relate to chromosome folding at the, at the level that I spoke about in the introduction? So when you look at all these structures, all these intermediates we delineated, like a whole chromosome or whole nucleus compartmentalization or a mitotic loop array of several microns, what is the topological state of chromatin inside these structures? We don't know. Now, <clears throat> the re we came about studying this uh, through a very indirect route, which typically happens in science. Uh, we didn't 
We weren't looking for this. We stumbled upon it and realized there is something we can do here. If you look at chromosomes in a crowded nucleus, uh, here, there's a picture from when, uh, oh, uh, a long time ago from Wendy Bitmore's lab imaging whole chromosomes. You can see they, they often interact. There's a lot of contact between chromosomes, and we can readily detect it in high C. So the question is, if, if it's a crowded nucleus and we have these interactions between the chromosomes, and we know TOPO2 is very abundant, there are about 500,000 TOPO2 enzymes per nucleus, do they become entangled locally? Do these chromosomes actually become entangled topologically at the local level? So here we have an interface between two chromosomes without topological entanglement. They, they, they overlap to some extent. There's certainly one territory that invades another, but to what extent? With topological entanglement, you can imagine the chromosomes can invade each other to a much larger extent. So what is that? Oops. At to what extent do different chromosomes or different domains within one chromosome become topologically entangled? How can we measure that? And it's difficult to measure because it's, it's by high C, for instance, I can measure one interaction uh, or another interaction, but I wouldn't be able to tell whether there is a catenation or not. A catenation, you need to know more about that interface than just a single point of contact. You need to have some more information. It's a global property of these molecules. So we actually realized uh, that you can learn more about this kind of interfaces, whether they're entangled or not, by measuring more than one interaction from that one interface from that single cell. So this comes uh, to an experiment that we did for totally different reasons, um, mapping co-occurring interactions in single cells. And really, this is a team that, that uh, has been involved in this. Um, and um, in my lab, and uh, we published this a while ago, but I will give the story as an introduction to new unbioarchived work. So the idea is not our idea. It was actually originally done by Amos Tanai's lab a number of years ago. If you do a classical 3C experiment, uh, we often think these assays capture pairwise interactions, but in fact they don't. They capture multi-way interactions. If you do a 3C experiment, you don't ligate just pairs. You ligate long strings of ligation products. They can be 10, 20, 30 kiloways in size. They contain up to 10 or 20 different fragments. And <clears throat> one way that people often think about this type of data is that this represents some kind of a hub where you have 10 loci coming together around some factory or something. Um, and I will tell you that that is probably the wrong interpretation. Um, but say what happens if multiple fragments that are all near each other in the cell nucleus, they get ligated together. Of course, each end can only get ligated to one other end, so you end up with a long string of molecules. And you can sequence that long molecule on a PAC bio instrument, or what we're currently doing is, of course, nanopore sequencing. And what you basically see is a, is, um, a multi-way interaction, uh, uh, what Amos and I uh, refer to as C-walks, and we have adopted that term because it turns out the term walk is exactly what it should be. So that was a really a good choice of term by his lab. So <clears throat> often people draw this particular path as all these in loci are interacting with each other. Uh, as I will show you in a second, it's actually a walk, a three-dimensional walk through the folded genome that represents this path. Okay, so <clears throat> why do I say this is not just a cluster of interacting loci? If this is a cluster of interacting loci, we can imagine any fragment can get ligated to any other with equal probability. If that is the case, this one cluster can give rise to multiple different types of ligation products. And if I were to sequence them, I would find that the order of these three fragments could be random. Okay? However, uh, what, I, what I'm going to argue is that it's actually a path, a lin or a, or like a three-dimensional walk through the folded genome, where you start at fragment one, which interacts with fragment two. Fragment two interacts with fragment three, but note that fragment one and three are actually not directly touching. So you're slowly walking away from the first fragment, and you're going all along, you, you're like, you, step by step, you walk through the folded genome. And that gives you a series of interactions of a local chromatin environment that you're probing that you can reveal by sequencing this molecule. Now, how do I know it's this model more likely than this model. Well, if I sequence this molecule, it would have a non-random order. 
The order of these fragments is not random. It represents where they are with respect to each other in the 3D structure, whereas in this model, they would be random. How do I know whether they're random or not? So we did an experiment where we make a couple million of these, um, these long molecules. We sequence them. And then we ask, OK, direct interactions are the pairwise interactions. The right adjacent to each other in this molecule, basically high C. That should be high C. Because in high C, I would break this molecule in tiny pieces and only sequence the direct interactions. An indirect interaction is between two molecules that are part of two fragments, part of the same molecule, but not directly ligated to each other. If the order is random, the direct interactions and indirect interactions should be equivalent in a population-wide uh, IC data set. And one way to look at that is to look at the, the contact frequency on the y-axis versus genomic distance. For direct interactions, they look like high C, as you would expect, because in high C, you're only sequencing the direct interactions. However, the indirect interactions are much more rare at shorter distances. These are log scale, and they get enriched for longer range interactions. And if you take only very long molecules, where they have lots of long indirect interactions, it gets flatter and flatter. And at some, molecule, at some point, this, this P of S plot is almost flat. So indirect interactions are not equivalent to direct interactions. The order is not random. Uh, and we're looking at a, a, a more like a, a path model. So this gave us an idea that if we have, we can just select paths that, for instance, start in one chromosome, take some number of steps through the folded genome, and end up in a second chromosome. That, this, that path will tell us something about the interface between two interacting chromosomes. And that interface can have different features. It can be a highly intermingled, either entangled or not entangled, interface, or it could be a very smooth interface. What, and you can tell them apart, because if you have a smooth interface, this C-walk will start in one chromosome, will stay in that one chromosome, and cross over to the other chromosome only once. And once it has crossed over, now it's in the other chromosome. So in a long walk, you would get chromosome one, chromosome one, chromosome one, chromosome one, step over to chromosome two, chromosome two, chromosome two, chromosome two. If it's highly entangled, it would walk back and forth between these chromosomes, one, two, one, two, one, two. So that's the, the key concept of basically the rest of the talk. If I look at long walks, do I have a lot of mingling of two interacting chromosomes or two interacting domains within one chromosome, or do they occur in these blocks with rarely a crossover from one domain to the other? And it turns out it's mostly smooth interfaces. So here is just an example of some data. If you have walks of only one step, or up to 10 steps, that's quite rare. Uh, on this pack bio data, we usually get maybe 5 to 10 KB sequences. Uh, most, most, long of the, most of these walks have about five, five, six, seven, three, four, five, six, seven steps. In this case, this is between two chromosomes. And I color here whether there is one or up to six steps back and forth between these two chromosomes. So again, we have a lot of data here, but we only look at data that where we have a C-walk that starts in one chromosome and ends in another chromosome, which is a very specific subset of the data. And it turns out you just have way more steps that stay within one chromosome than you would expect. This is the experimental data. The longer the walk, the rarer it gets to actually get a crossover. Because once you crossed over to the next chromosome, you just stay in that chromosome. And if you add more steps, you just stay in that chromosome. And if you permutate these walks and say, oh, maybe the fragments are in random order, you typically have much lower intrachromosomal step. In other words, you see fewer steps between the chromosomes than you would expect by random chance. So that would kind of like lead to the idea that this interface is relatively smooth. They're not completely intermingled where the two chromosomes, you can't tell them apart. OK, we can look inside one chromosome. And we, we, the high C map tells us like there are these domains, A domains and B domains, that interact in three-dimensional space. When they do, do they become mingled with each other? Or do they just touch each other? We can do the same thing. We can take a C walk. It starts in one compartment domain, and it crosses over to the other one. What does the data look like? And just to summarize, it looks exactly the same. You have way more steps within one domain, a few steps between the domains than you would expect by permutation. So anytime we look at two domains, in cis or in trans, 
their, their interfaces look quite smooth. And this took us a long time. We had this data for several years, and I just didn't know how to think about it. Uh, we drew these kinds of diagrams, like that you walk, walk, walk within one domain, you cross over to the other. Why would it be smooth? So then Davu joined my lab, and he, when I told him about the data, he was a polymer physicist. He still is a polymer physicist, and uh, he, he is no longer in my lab. But uh, he, uh, he said, this is what you would expect. If you have two like, blobs of polymer and you push them against each other, they wouldn't really interpenetrate very much. There's some, there's some entanglement, but they wouldn't really mix very much, unless they're almost phantom or there is, there is a lot of opportunity for strand passage, then they will penetrate much deeper. So he decided to simulate that, in this case with some Monte Carlo simulations. Here he takes two circular domains. Of course, we're talking about chromosomes in humans. These are not circular domains, but again, we're assuming here, we're looking at a local blob in the polymer, the ends, the telomeres are really far away, and the cell has no, this domain doesn't have knowledge of the fact that it's on a linear versus a circular molecule. If you just have them in a pretty crowded environment, although we vary the, how crowded it is to quite extent, uh, you can see there's some mingling. The blue comes into the, the, the yellowish polymer quite a bit. But if you have to simulate topo2 activity, there's much more mingling. So the question is, <clears throat> OK, uh, which of these scenarios fits the experimental data? So now we're going to actually simulate one of these multi-contact experiments. We just simulate uh, uh, an experiment where you start in one fragment. We walk around with a random walk in 3D. And we, find, we, we select a subset of walks that go from the blue domain into the yellow domain. And we ask, we analyze it in the same way we do for experimental data. Is it this scenario or this scenario? OK. So here we have uh, two domains. They are, there's no strand passage here. They cannot become topologically catenated. There is quite an, a, a rich interface of interactions between these two domains. And we can just look again at the sea walks that go from one domain to the other and ask how many intradomainal steps do we have compared to permutation. And you can see you have fewer steps between the domains than you would expect. In fact, it looks very similar to what we observe in experiment. Um, there is, there is just uh, fewer steps between the domains than you would expect. However, if you have a topo2 activity, you, you allow strands to cross each other. Um, you basically see the, the fragments in the sea walk become randomly ordered because you just go back and forth between these two domains. Now, this is a fully entangled state, of course, versus a fully unentangled. So we're looking at the extremes here. So this led us to conclude that um, the data, the experimental data that we have, suggests that when domains or chromosomes uh, interact inside the cell nucleus, there's very little evidence that there's actually strand passage between these two domains. So there's a few thoughts came out of this story. One is that this kind of C walks or multi-contact 3C data actually reflects what we call percolation paths through the 3D structure of the genome, that, which is, I think, an idea that hasn't really been uh, used by, by other people, but I think it could be really interesting when you think about the data that way, because you get a lot of coordinated information from a single cell without having to do the scary stuff with single cells as an experimentalist. So we have paths that cross the interface of interacting domains, and they, these interfaces are rather smooth, suggesting there's limited uh, entanglement. Um, and I must say, other people have shown recently also at a smaller scale than what we're looking at by fish, by reanalyzing published fish data, fish data, that at that scale there's no nodding or entanglements in the chromosomes either. And I spoke a lot with people, and I would love to hear more thoughts from people who make models of, of chromosomes based on high C data. Do you see any entanglements in those models? Because I'm very curious, particularly models coming from single cell data. So we concluded at the time that the interface genome is largely not entangled. I still find rather an amazing finding because you have this very long molecule crammed up in the nucleus and there's nothing, no entanglements. I never managed to put a piece of rope in my pocket, get it out without it being entangled. OK, so this is actually very puzzling because TOPA2 is an enzyme that acts locally. It sees two pieces of DNA and it could cross one through the other. It has no knowledge of the more global conformation of the polymer. It doesn't know when it makes a strand passage, whether it would entangle or disentangle or catenate or decatenate the chromosomes. So how does it work? Uh, for some reason, 
uh, in cells, either there's no TOPO2 activity, which would be a shocker, um, there is TOPO2 activity, um, or TOPO2 knows what it's doing, or it's being told what to do, so that catenations or entanglements are being selectively removed. How does that work? And again, I think the cell cycle provides us with a really powerful experimental system because you have all these changes in chromosome conformation, and I'll tell you in a second, the entanglement state also changes during the cell cycle, again, giving us experimental opportunities to interrogate what's going on uh, when cells actively entangle and disentangle their genome. So I, I told you we have some evidence that in interface, entanglements are rare, at least. Um, what about mitosis? This is a highly packed, highly condensed state. And uh, I didn't tell you this, but the condensins form this loop array. But the second most important protein on this chromosome is toposomerase 2. So topo 2 is an integral structural component of the mitotic chromosome, whether it's actually making any catenations, we don't know. It probably does multiple things. So we repeated these, some of these multi-contact experiments through the cell cycle. And this is work really led by Erica, a postdoc in my lab, really a superstar, and, and more recently joined by Kirill, who works at Livlian at Murney. Um, and they joined forces doing both experiments and simulations, as I'll show you in a second. But most of the work is from Erica. Um, with some initial assist by Bastian, who actually made the original discover of the cell cycle dynamics and concatenations. No relation, as Leonid said, Decker is a very common name. Uh, but there are many Deckers in this field, including my twin brother, who is the other Decker on the 3C paper. There's a lot of confusion about it. Um, OK, so again, as, 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 uh, as I said, this is, I love to get feedback on this story. It, it's, it's on bioarchived. We're trying to put it together. Uh, and I think it's an interesting story. OK. So we well, now want to measure entanglements in the same way I just described for interface chromosomes, but now for mitotic chromosomes. How do we do that? We looked at compartment domains in interface, but there's no compartmentalization in mitosis. So we're going to do it a little bit differently. Actually, Erica came up with this approach. We're just looking at two regions along a chromosome, and we can define the size of that region. They could be separated by some genomic distance, and we can choose that distance. And we can look at seawalks that, that go back and forth between these two domains. And that represents data coming from a single cell in which those two distal domains happen to be interacting. OK? So this is every seawalk is a single cell instance of a contact between two distal regions. And we can ask, OK, these two regions are interacting in that single cell. Do they cross over once or multiple times? That's basically mingled, smooth interface. OK, so that's, that's what we do. We, we can find for a set of regions of a, separated by a given size, we can calculate what we call the intermingling metric, which represents what fraction of, of, of interfaces, so each one would be an instance in a single cell, what fraction of those interfaces have multiple back and forth between the domains, or just one. So it's a very simple metric. Uh, that's what we came up with, but it, it seems to be doing the job. So now we look at the data a little bit different than I showed you before. Now we have this feature of genomic distance between the domains. If we look at domains at different distances along a chromosome, and we look at the cells where they do interact and ask to what extent are the interfaces mingled. This is G1. Intermingling is low, lower than you would expect for a fully mingled. This is uh, simulated by permutations. So again, this confirms that in G1 cells, there's very little intermingling if you calculate it this way. In mitosis, you get much higher mingling. Now these regions are not fully mingled, but they're almost fully mingled. There's a lot of mixing between domains when they um, touch each other in mitotic chromosomes. OK, so when I drew this, this picture of an interface chromosome with all these loops neatly layered on top of each other, None of these loops were catenated, in part because I don't know how to draw that in Illustrator. But I figured out actually these loops are catenated with each other inside this chromosome. Okay? There's lots of catenations between loops, maybe even between different layers of these loops along the linear chromosome. Now, the fact that mitotic chromosomes could be intrachromosomally catenated is not a new idea. In fact, uh, John Marco presented some really exciting um, data 
more than a decade ago, showing that mitotic chromosomes are constrained by topo 2 mediated catenations. And this is important for the re mechanical rigidity of chromosomes. Chromosomes need to be stiff in mitosis for their accurate chromosome segregation. So this is not just some kind of an accidental thing, I believe. These catenations contribute to the mechanical properties of mitotic chromosomes, uh, and that is important for their segregation. Now, it also means that as cells cycle through their cell cycle, they're actually actively catenating and decatenating or entangling and disentangling their chromosomes, which I think is a really fascinating uh, concept. So the question is, how does that work? Okay, so, so what we did is an experiment. We can actually use highly synchronized cells to follow this process of entanglement and disentanglement through the cell cycle. So in this case, we are starting with prometaphase, uh, late mitosis, prometaphase arrested cells. We, we, we play them just to make sure we only have mitotic cells and release them into the next cell cycle. Now in these HeLa cells, it takes about two hours by which time they are in anaphase and telophase. The chromosomes have just segregated. They're still in, inside one cell. Um, and then the, the, the nuclear envelope reforms, cell divides, cytokinesis, and so on. So across this time course, we can take samples and do this multi-contact 3C experiment. So it is basically a similar representation of the data I just showed you, that in G1 cells, we have this low level of concatenations. In prometaphase, we have a higher uh, level of mingling. And we can see that as you, if you start in prometaphase, you have highly intermingled chromatin. You exit mitosis. By two hours, you're in telophase. Most of the entanglements are already gone. So the two hours seems like a long time, but most of the time is spent in these cells recovering from the arrest. From going from prometaphase or metaphase to telophase, it's a really fast process. We're talking about maybe 10, 15 minutes. So that means that initially, um, when cells exit mitosis, it can very, quite quickly remove all that intermingling. But it's not quite done yet. Even in G1, you go lower and lower in the intermingling. So there is still entanglements by telophase that need to be removed in the first few hours of, uh, a, a G, of the subsequent G1. Now, I have been talking about all these intermingling, saying that they are actually topological structures in which made by topo2. And if that is indeed the case, the polymer simulations suggest that is the case. If that is indeed the case, this demingling should be topo2 dependent if these are really like topological structures. So what happens in this experiment if I block topo2? Now, there's a little bit of a complication in that experiment because you can't block topo2 in mitosis. The cells will never exit mitosis because they cannot disentangle the sister chromatids. They're also entangled with each other. I didn't mention that, and I won't mention it again. Uh, but um, it, you can't add to, inhibitors to topo2 right at the beginning of the experiment. You can only add it after the sister chromatids have separated, which is by anaphase telophase. So that gives us a limited opportunity to actually test topo2. In fact, this first drop from prometaphase to telophase, we can't really block topo2 during this step. We can only look at this smaller change from telophase to G1. Is this drop to really low levels of mingling, is that, can you inhibit that by blocking topo2? And the answer is yes. If I add topo2, or Erica adds topo2 at anaphase, telophase, here's the red line when the cells are actually later in G1. It looks just like the telophase state. In other words, in the experiment where you start in mitosis, you have this level of mingling. By telophase, you have this level of mingling. Then you block topo2, you stay at that level, and you don't reach the G1 lower level of intermingling. So at least for that last step, we can actually experimentally interrogate uh, that, that final drop in this entangling is topo2 dependent. Another way of looking at it is saying, OK, by telophase, I have a remaining level of mitotic entanglements on the chromosome. Does that interfere with the reformation of the interface conformation? And the answer is yes. So now we do the same experiment. We have mitotic cells. We release them by telophase. We block topo2. There's still a level of remaining catenations I just showed you. And then we wait a several hours, but then do high C, just conventional high C, to look to see does any of the features I talked about, the checkerboard pattern and so on, do they form if you have remaining to, uh, mitotic entanglements that you cannot resolve because there's no topo2. Now in mitosis, as I showed you before, you have this rather dull looking contact map. 
if you release these cells into G1, all these structures reform. But you look at the cells that you block topo2 at telophase uh, with a topo2 inhibitor ICRF. You, one thing that, that characterizes mitotic chromosomes is this band of enriched interactions up to maybe 10 megabase. In a normal mitotic exit, those enriched mitotic interactions are lost quite effect efficiently, and you form this beautiful checkerboard. However, that is topo2 dependent. In the, if you block topo2, you have this memory of this mitotic state you can't resolve, and we think this is due to the remaining topological entanglements. And in fact, Kirill in Leonid's lab has been able to simulate that by polymer simulations, and indeed shows that a low level of entanglement that's still there slows down the compartmentalization in the next year one. Okay, so we can see it actually really has an effect if you can't resolve these topological catenations. Okay, so we know we, we're going from a catenated or, or entangled state in metaphase to an unentangled state in interphase. Most of, the, most of this happens during anaphase, telophase, and in early G1. It doesn't really solve the question as to how this works. We know you, you, you go towards this entanglement, but what drives this process? Topo2 doesn't know whether it's, it's making a catenation or removing one. So what Kirill came up with is if you, it could be driven by chromosome decondensation. So in my, this is a simulated mitotic chromosome. It represents the high C data quite nicely. Here in red, we have the loop basis of condensins. And here's a catenation map. Each dot basically represents a, whether there's a catenation between two distal loops or not. So we can see there's, there's lots of nearby loops that get catenated, but some longer range catenations. Loops are catenated. If you just re remove the, the constraints on this chromosome that make it compact into a small volume and let it decondense, you get decatenation of the loops. Just the moving away of chromatin from each other is enough of a directionality to topo2 to, to drive it towards decatenating chromosomes. So it's just a really a biophysical decondensation process that can actually contribute to decatenation of loops. Well, that's nice, uh, but what about interface? Your interface nucleus is not constantly decondensing. At some point, it's just there. You have a nucleus. There's no change in condensation. Why does topo2 not start to entangle the genome again? So at steady state, there are no entanglements. So what prevents topo2 from re-entangling the interface nucleus? And there are some really interesting ideas um, from, from uh, Orlandinia and others, but there are several ideas that have been proposed, that loop extrusion, which strictly acts in cis, could actually localize knots and catenations to specific places, and now topo2 knows what to do when it acts right, for instance, in front of an extruding cohesin where the knot of this molecule gets localized in front of the machine, topo2 knows which strand to pass, and it will lead to a topological simplification of these molecules. Okay, that sounds like an interesting idea, and by polymer simulations, it works. Does it work in experiment? Do cells do this? Um, so there's an experiment, um, Dyson et al., a very nice experiment in yeast, where they show that condensed immediate loop extrusion is required for decatenating mini chromosomes. These are circular mini chromosomes in yeast. What about chromosomes in humans? So <clears throat> you can remove the loop extrusion machine in human cells by degrading with an inducible dacron like RAT21, a subunit of cohesin, we've heard about it before. If you remove cohesin from interface cells, you remove all the loops. Uh, they're gone after the cohesin is lost, and this was, of course, first shown by R.S. Aiden's lab, but has been subsequently confirmed by others. This is data from Erica. Compartmentalization is stable. In fact, if anything, it gets stronger, um, so it's not dependent on cohesin. So we use these cells to remove cohesin and ask, do the chromosomes become entangled? Very simple question. So what we do is we take G1 cells. These are different cells than we used before. Uh, Red 21 uh, with a decron domain. We degrade cohesin and ask, OK, uh, do we see intermingled interfaces of compartments, yes or no? In fact, we use a similar trick that Erica used for mitosis. We don't just focus on compartment domains. We just look at two distal domains. When they interact, do they become mingled? And we do the same metric 
uh, that, is there only one step between the domains or multiple steps back and forth, this intermingling metric. So when we do that experiment, again, this is a different cell line than I showed you before, but we see the same result. In interface, this is G1, chromosomes have a low level of mingling compared to what we would expect when the domains are fully mingled. When I remove RAD21, Erica removes RAD21, we see an increase in mingling between, compart between domains. Particularly, we don't understand why, but particularly at this length scale of, of 20 to 30 megabase. Uh, these are quite distal domains, and when they interact, they, be, they used to have a smooth interface, now their interface is mingled, catenated. Is it catenated? Well, if this is a topological catenation, this should not happen if I block topo 2. And indeed, it doesn't happen. When we remove cohesin while also blocking topo 2, then there is no mingling. This increase in mingling is a topoisomerase dependent process. Now, when I add only topo Two inhibitors, nothing happens, of course. You can't change the topological state without topo 2. OK, so this really suggests, and I'm very excited about this result, that cohesin and loop extrusion might actually play an important role in re constantly removing catenations from the genome or entanglements between domains. So what we think is happening is, in mitosis, we have a highly entangled structure. And in, in, in interface, we have unentangled structures. These are conversions between these states require topo 2, but topo 2 doesn't know what it's doing, whether it's going backwards or forwards. It, it needs some instructions. When you exit mitosis, the instruction could be decondensation. It will drive towards decatenation. Once you're in G1, to maintain this state in the face of constant action of topo 2, which would basically get an equilibrium between entangled and non-entangled, we have cohesive mediate loop extrusion that pushes the entanglement towards unentanglement in a topo 2 dependent manner. So that's why in interface you end up in a steady state that is largely unentangled. OK. So here's an idea. Uh, maybe that is why we have loop extrusion. Uh, it is actively uh, 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 keeping the genome free of entanglements. And only later did it get co-opted by the cell to use for other things like long-range gene regulation. Maybe that's why it's so hard to pin at the, the key role of, of cohesin in enhancer promoter interactions. It is doing it in specific cases, but maybe it, there's a lot of loop extrusion in heterochromatin. No genes. There's plenty of loop extrusion going on there. And maybe this is to keep that area of the genome unentangled. OK, just to summarize. We have three pre I think there are three chromosome folding processes, at least, that we need to think about. During the cell cycle, we have this alternation between cohesin and condensin action. We have this alternation between compartmentalization and non-compartmentalization. And now we have this alternation between unentangled, entangled, and unentangled through the cell cycle. And there is, of course, lots of interplay between all these different structures. And these are some of the uh, phenomena. These are some of the questions we're currently looking at, like what is the connection between any of these three phenomena? I already showed you that loop extrusion affects entanglements. We think loop extrusion affects compartmentalization, and so on. And of course, what I didn't tell you is how does the mitotic chromosome become entangled in the first place? If loop extrusion leads to disentanglement, the mitotic chromosome is made by loop extrusion. That's what condensin does. So why is that mitotic chromosome entangled? I don't understand it. It probably means condensin and cohesin act differently with topo2. There's also two different topo2s. One that acts in mitosis, one that acts in interface, and so on. And of course, you have no idea about any of the molecular mechanisms. This is pure phenomenology at this point. With that, I'd like to thank the people from my lab here, indicated in red, participated to the work I presented today. Uh, we have great collaborations. With Leonid, uh, Anton, and Bill Earnshaw, and others over the years have really contributed to our thinking, uh, and these are my funding agencies. Thank you. It's also just first going to answer one of your questions. You asked, what do people get from HI-C? Uh, the chairman here 
uh, six years ago and, and used maximum entropy in version of Hi-C and got that there was no entanglement in the interface uh, chromosome of that particular case. Now, uh, the mechanism of that seems to be more this sort of local reginification of the, the, uh, the chains. Um, now, the only thing that kind of makes me worry a little bit about ours, us is the same was true of the metaphase chromosome when it's inverted. It ends up having, you know, reasonably correct structure overall, and at the length scale of the simulation, it didn't have many entanglements at all. It may be that we're just, we're working at a much larger length scale or something, maybe Ben can answer that with, uh, uh, I don't know if you've continued any more work in that direction. Right, I mean, uh, I, mean I think we are, there we are also looking at uh, a, probably a coarser re resolution, we're looking at you know, 100 KB resolution, where, uh, and to beyond that length scale, maybe there's not a lot of knots. I, I don't like to be. Yeah, so these are, I mean, again, I, I also want to just be very careful. We're measuring mingling, I mean, interpreting it as entanglement. So that's why we do the top two experiments. So I want to be very careful about it. Uh, I like it that it's catenated versus uncatenated, but uh, we don't measure it directly. No, we infer it from the extent of mingling and the fact that it's topo two dependent. Um, in Kirill simulations, it seems like you have about 0.6 of 60% of the loops have one catenation, and these loops are about 100 kb. So you might miss it if you look at a, at a more coarser grained structure. Absolutely. Hi, very nice talk. Um, um, so is there um, any significant difference in the condensing concentration level between a mitotic phase and an interface phase? Interface. In condensing? Yeah, I, sorry. The topo, yeah, topo two. There is actually, so there, Okay, so I didn't mention it, but SL cycle, they, they also alternate topo isoform. There are two topo two alpha and beta. In mitosis, it's mostly alpha, and it's very highly expressed in mitosis. Some of it gets lost during mitotic exit, so now you have less topo. You also switch from topo to alpha to beta. They're very differently regulated, but post translation, translation, so they have lots of other levels of regulation of their activity that we don't even talk about here. So I think, although I'm not sure, but I know there are people in the audience working on Topo2 who know, may know more about it than me. Um, Topo2 activity is highly regulated, particularly in mitosis. So whether the Topo2 activity level is the same, regardless of the level of the protein, uh, at different stages of the cell cycle, I don't know. It seems like Topo2 activity, in inter there's a lot of Topo2 activity, but it may not be very active. Um, the level of, of entanglement we see if we block cohesin is not that high. Um, we think in part because of experimental reasons. Um, we can only look at a very narrow time window. The cohesin depletion takes a while. Um, so we don't give the cells a lot of time to become entangled. It's another way of saying it. So, but I really don't know. I wish I could measure the topo 2 activity in a way that, that's independent of these kinds of assays. But there's a lot of fluctuation in, in levels, activities over the cell cycle, absolutely. Do you also think the, um, the topo to activity can affect the, you know, the condensing extrusion um, and the, ex is it, yeah, the extent of it so that it can also affect the like, helical structure as well? Absolutely, again, I, I think that is probably happening. Now that we know there's this, other people have shown this before, of course, in bacteria and other organisms, uh, where there is this in, SMC complexes were originally found as working with topo2 and others. So no doubt there is a lot of interplay between them in both directions, with topo2 also affecting the ability of loop extrusion. I can imagine if you have an entangled or uh, supercoupled substrate, the substrate is for cohesin and condensin mediated extrusion is now different. And, and we know from other experiments that the substrate, even histomodifications determine the extrusion speed, how much cohesin and condensing gets loaded. So again, I think at a molecular level, there's going to be intense interplay between these machines. And it's clearly something we and others are interested in pursuing. And I think what is interesting with some of these experiments we're developing now, we may have a readout for what happens at the chromosomal level 
when you do perturbations in the molecular interplay between these machines. So I think this is a great opportunity. I have no answers yet, but I know, I mean, I think it's a rich area of investigation. <laughs> it's on bioarchive right now. Yeah, whether it physically directly interacts, I'm always a little bit confused about it. If you look on the chromosome, they co-localize at specific elements, like CTCF sites. Cohesin piles up at CTCF sites on one end of the CTCF, and topo 2 beta is on the other side. Uh. Now, whether that is where everything happens, I don't know, because we, we actually, I didn't show the results, but a lot of the entanglements we see when you deplete cohesin, is happening in heterochromatin, where there are no CTCF sites occupied by CTCF. So it can happen at other sites as well. You just, with these kind of chip experiments, you see where everything piles up. But yeah, they're, they, they're very closely connected at promoters, at CTCF sites, enhancers, and we know you can measure topo 2 activity at those sites. Mm -hmm. Whether that is cohesin dependent, I don't think anybody's ever looked. Um, I have one other question, which is, if the, if the chromosomes are aligned on, on the metaphase plate, why would you want to have them be entangled if they have to <laughs> segregate to the two daughter cells? Yes, exactly. Uh, that is a great point. Because something really interesting is having mitosis. Now, the, what I talk about are intrachromosomal catenations. Um, the sister chromatids are originally, after replication, entirely entangled. Now, they're completely wrapped around. They have to be separated. So what, what needs to happen in mitosis, this is mind-boggling. Topologically, the chromosomes become intrachromosomally entangled, but the scissors need to be disentangled. We don't know how that's regulated. How do non-sister non chromatids not become entangled? I, I don't know. So it's kind of like what happens in bacterial replication at the end when you have to decatenate two circles? Absolutely. And, the, and, and, and mechanical forces from the spindles might derive, d yeah. drive topo 2 in that example, yes. Hi. Oh, Yo, I'm here. Oh, OK. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. Hi, Dave. Uh, yeah, great talk. Um, I, I have a question regarding the lifetimes of association of the condensin 1 and condensin 2 in the myelitic chromosomes. And they're not as long as, it, as, as, as far as I know, the times in which it stays there uh, uh, to get to the uh, mitosis and so on. So these entanglements, as it were, um, you're given a static view of, um, uh, of it as though it's a little permanent, but in fact it has a lifetime that can't be much larger than the time scale in which condensin 1 or condensin 2 stay on the chromosomes. Yeah, I, I like that, that, that idea very much. I think what we're missing, maybe not just in our data, but maybe even in our thinking, is the, 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 time, the time dimension here that loop extrusion can happen quite fast, and there are some ideas like how, how fast condensin 1 and 2 turn over on the mitotic chromosome, and I know you have been looking at that too in your modeling. Um, some, some people think condensin 2 does not turn over at all, but it, there's probably turn over there too. Condensin 1 comes and goes all the time. So maybe what we're looking at at steady state is like a dynamic equilibrium between constant catenation and decatenation. Um, and in interface, that equilibrium ends up being mostly disentangled. Maybe in mitosis, the high density of the loops will give you some catenation, and that's what we're measuring. That's entirely possible. Yeah. I think we need to know more about the timescales of, of extrusion and, and topo 2. I don't know who has the microphone. There you go. Turn it. A naive question. Uh the catenations that you're measuring with your C walk and like your mingling matrix or your measurement, do they correlate with like kind of old school measurements of catenations, maybe with like 2D gels or some other, maybe and maybe like a more simple, sim like a more simplified assay or, or something like that? Those are not simple assays. Uh, but um, so, okay, I don't know the answer to that question. What we're currently doing, I kind of have hidden that in the presentation. What we're looking at is just the statistical properties of these seawalks. We haven't boiled it down to specific loci in the genome. And the reason for that is we only have maybe a million of these strings. 
That gives you, it's a very low density of context. So now, with, with long read sequencing becoming more affordable and also the numbers will look better, we can, we hope in the coming uh, year or two, to get much higher resolution and be able to say for specific smaller domains than what we're looking at here. We look at megabase to megabase. Can we do it much smaller and localize these positions of catenations? Do they end up at CTCF sites and get resolved there? Do they end up at promoters or other places? Uh, then we can start to see of all the other features people have learned about localizing these knots and catenation sites, how does it relate to chromatin and how does it relate to, to cis elements that I mean, I now currently think that a lot of elements that we have annotated in the genome, like CTCF, what is it doing? And then people break their fights over it, like it's involved in transcription here or no. Maybe a lot of these elements are actually involved in just maintaining a topological state of the genome. They're just uh, basically moonlighting with other functions that we haven't anticipated. So. Funny you ask, we're applying these CBOX to my favorite organism, which I wouldn't call lower organism. Uh, it's a dinoflagellate, which has very strange condensed, people think super cold chromosomes. It's a eukaryote. Um, and we, we see similar things, actually. Uh, so and they don't even have histones. It's a very different type of organism. Uh, so yeah, we're following that logic that you suggest, um, because I think there's something to be learned there. Uh, hi, uh, Bram Prevel, Earnshaw Lab. Uh, I had a question. So do we know that if TOPO2 activity is dependent on uh, local tension in DNA or local DNA conformation, uh, and is there maybe some way using optical tweezers that we can kind of assess these, uh, this idea? Yeah, that's a, it's a very good suggestion. We know from other work that, yes, it is, it is sensitive to um, uh, local conformation of DNA. So when I presented Orlandini's model of localizing knots by, by extrusion, by basically pushing them, and then TOPO2 would resolve it. That's one idea. Another idea is that if you have loop conformations, within the loops you could have kinks and so on, and those could be preferred sites for TOPO2 action as well. So there are other ideas related to, I think, local DNA structure that could maybe depend on cohesion and guide TOPO2. Um, yeah, and related to that, of obviously, the, let's say the local lifetime of the entanglement, right? Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Beautiful Hi. talk. Um, I have a question about the confirmation of the DNA as well. We know that TOPO2 prefers to untangle positive supercoils, so the crossover is really important. It's not a stupid enzyme. Um, it has definitely preferences in what it wants to disentangle. Have you guys started to look at the supercoiling state by using one of these proteins that acts as like a supercoiling sensor like GAPR or using Sorolin? I know all the problems with that. But some way of potentially looking at what are those crossovers at the entanglement sites and would TOPO2 prefer and not prefer to, to, to deal with that? Yeah, thank you for, for pointing it out that TOPO2 is not a stupid enzyme. Uh, you're absolutely right. And, and uh, at the level that we look at, we just have no knowledge of these local structures, so we kind of like don't know what to say about it. Uh, there are several reagents you can use for measuring local uh, supercoiling or other things. Um, and we're, we're trying them. Uh, we haven't made them work yet. Um, so that's unfortunate, but um, there, there are some of these proteins that bind specifically to these supercoiled structures or some of these more uh, soil and base molecules. You can, you can map genome-wide the, the, the super helicity. Um, we've been trying to do that, and we just have had no luck getting good data in human cells. But you're absolutely right. That is an area we should explore. I mean, the only thing we're describing right now is the phenomenon, uh, the molecular mechanism of, of, of how actually TOPO2 gets guided to do what it should do. Um, it's probably a combination of uh, the local chromatin template, uh, that was the, how the two molecules get juxtaposed, um, and other phenomena that are acting on the molecule, like cohesin. We don't know. I just presented one model that I find appealing, but I think there's all these things are acting together. And um, again, this is for us a new area. So I'm learning about TOPO2, and the more I learn about it, it's just, it's just amazing it's one of the most amazing enzymes, and we should talk more about it. <laughs> yes. Hi. Maybe one last question. Sorry. So, yeah, I wanted to continue uh, the discussion about TOPO2. So what is ICRF really doing? Like, 
uh, how how is it blocking topo two because it yeah is it okay so this is something that that, that is <laughs> kind of amazing. Uh, there's a whole series of ice here have TOPO2 inhibitors, and they act with different affinities to block TOPO2 activity. So the TOPO2 cycle, when it binds and, and cleaves and passes, it, it's a very complicated machine that, that gates and open and closed. ICRF is, is thought to lead to a closed clamp intermediate. Um, there's a lot of debate as to whether this is happening before or after strand cleavage. Right. Um, but, but either way, it seems like you're clamping the TOPO2 in a closed state around the DNA, and now it's inactive. So it can act as a cross-linker, essentially. I thought for a while it could cross-link two molecules, but it seems there's some, there's some and maybe there are people in the audience who can educate me there, uh, whether it actually holds one or two molecules. Because at first I thought maybe it can just hold the two states. That would be really interesting, because then I could use that intermediate to identify where it's trying to do a strand passage. There are two pieces of DNA there. Uh, but it seems like it's, in many cases there's just one piece of DNA. I see. And uh, one more question. Okay, that's fine. We can we talk can in follow the break. Up. I don't want to take time away from Mitch. Yeah, one very quick question. Two hours. May I ask one last question? Uh, how did you go about uh, simulating topo in Davout's simulations? Was it simple crossing, allowing for the crossing of the chains, or was there something else? No, it is not a KT. Okay. Uh, 